do um, turn back with me this morning to the passage we read in Mark's Gospel, those verses at the end of chapter 8 and on into chapter 9. And over the past few weeks we've been uh, looking at these words at the end of chapter 8 as Christ instructs his disciples in what it means to be a disciple and to follow him. And this morning we come to the end of this dialogue and uh, passage of instruction. Having spoken of his rejection and his death and his resurrection in the verses that immediately precede the passage that we read and then of the path of discipleship in those verses that we did read at the end of chapter 8, he draws his teaching to a close with a promise of greater and more glorious things to come. A promise that we find in the first verse of chapter 9, which will be our text for this morning. And he said to them, Assuredly I say to you that there are some standing here who will not taste death till they see the kingdom of God present with power. Now, I'm sure all of us are aware that every single word that is recorded in the scripture comes with divine authority. That every word that the Lord Jesus Christ spoke as he walked upon this earth were the very words of God. That the words that he spoke and the words that are recorded in scripture for us are no less almighty, they're no less powerful, they're no less awe-inspiring than those words that we read in verse 7 where we're told the Father himself speaks out of a cloud saying, this is my beloved Son, hear him. But there are times when Christ himself makes a particular point of reminding us of the importance and the glory of what he's saying. And he often does this by prefixing his words with assuredly, as we have here in verse 1 of chapter 9, or as it's sometimes translated in other versions, truly, truly, most assuredly, or verily, verily, And we have here one such instance. Here are words that Christ especially wants his disciples to take note of and to take hold of, to remember. They are words of encouragement to them. They are words of challenge. And they are words of expectation. Not only for those who heard them when they were first uttered, but for us as we gather here this morning. They're encouraging because they speak assuredly of the coming of the kingdom of God, that it is going to be present upon this earth. They're challenging because assuredly only some of these people who heard these words will see it. And they are words filled with expectation because assuredly when the kingdom comes it will come with power. And as it was then so it is now. Today those words of Christ are as relevant to us as we gather here this morning. We could put it this morning, assuredly, Christ says to us as we gather here at Zion Baptist Church in Bedworth on the morning of the 26th of November 2003, there are some who will not taste death till they see the kingdom of God present 
with power. So this morning, let us consider these words. Let us likewise be encouraged by them. Don't know how you've come into this place this morning. There may be some here who have come in downcast and burdened. Maybe you've come needing encouragement. Maybe this morning these are words for you. But whilst it is true that Christ's kingdom is not of this world, nevertheless it is firmly established within it. This morning we can be encouraged because there is a king and a kingdom that is found in this world of sin and sorrow, of pain and distress, whose reign is one of peace and mercy, of compassion and hope, of strength and power. There is at reign in this world a king whose reign is sure and is as lasting and as powerful as the being of God himself. It's a kingdom which knows no boundary. It's a kingdom which encompasses, as Paul declares, as he writes to the Galatians, Jew and Greek, slave and free, male and female. There is a kingdom in this world that is present, and a king who is present, that knows no setback, that knows no defeat, that knows no retreat. A kingdom which is growing even this day. A kingdom which, as Daniel saw, will grow to fill the whole world and will outlast every kingdom and empire of man. It is a kingdom that many of those that Christ was speaking to here in Mark 8 would witness its coming as Christ conquered and overcame all who stood in his way. As Christ removed the penalty of sin as he gave his life to redeem his servants. As Christ destroyed him who had the power of death and overcame death itself through his resurrection. As he returned to his Father in glory and received that name which is above all names, and was given and granted all authority in heaven and upon earth. As he poured out his spirit upon his disciples, and under the power of the spirit, those disciples preached the gospel. Some of those who were gathered here on this occasion before Christ would be witnesses to all of these things. They would see, as it were, the great victory and the glorious commencement of this kingdom which continues to grow to this day we sang of that victory in our last hymn the head that once was crowned with thorns is crowned with glory now a royal diadem adorns the mighty victor's brow here's a king friends this morning who has defeated every foe and every fear 
that you or I will ever know or ever have to face. Today, you and I are granted the privilege and the honor of living in the age of this kingdom, the age of the gospel of grace and mercy. The strong man who held the world in darkness has been bound and his house is being plundered. Today, there is a kingdom and a king against which the gates of Hades cannot prevail. And the wonder and the encouragement and the blessing for you and I this morning is that each and every one of us qualifies to seek refuge with this king. Each and every one of us here gathered this morning qualifies to seek a place in his kingdom. Were you aware of that this morning as you came? That you are qualified to come before the King of kings and the Lord of lords? That you are qualified to come before the great and the almighty, eternal God? Well, you are. Because here is the invitation that Christ himself gives. Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. We can be encouraged this morning. Because the kingdom of God is a kingdom of repentant sinners. It's a kingdom of those who were once dead in trespasses and sins. It's a kingdom that is present in power. A power found in the blood and the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ. A power that is sufficient to cleanse, to reconcile, and to transform those who once were children of wrath into those who are the children of the living God. This morning, be encouraged. There is a king and a kingdom present in this world that you can seek refuge in. But secondly, this text is a challenge. The passage starts in verse 34 of Mark 8 with the Lord Jesus Christ calling the people to himself with his disciples. They were all told of the coming kingdom and of its power. They were all aware of it. They all heard of it. And yet only some would see it. Of those who heard these words, we only know of Judas Iscariot, who wouldn't see it. But there may well have been others. Judas was estranged and separated from the disciples as Christ rose from the dead. And by the time of Pentecost, if not by the time of the resurrection, he himself would be dead. But I wonder how many others of these people who were present heard these words and yet rejected Christ despite his victory at Calvary. More pertinently, how many today, how many of those gathered here this morning of us will hear again the good news of the gospel of grace and mercy 
How many today up and down this land in congregations will hear of the power of Christ the King to save and of the glory of his kingdom and yet will never witness it because they have chosen to reject him. Today, as every week, up and down this land, there are congregations that are mixed. Congregations that consist of those who have seen the kingdom of God present with power in their own lives and in their own hearts. And those who have not. And today there is only one question for us to ask. Have we seen his kingdom present in us, in power? And if we haven't, will we see it before we taste death? This morning is an opportunity again for every one of us to examine ourselves to look into our own hearts and to ask whether the kingdom of God is indeed present with power within us. That power flows from the work of Christ. It flows from the love of the Father. It flows from the indwelling of the Spirit. And as we look at in our hearts this morning, can we say there is a work of grace that is indeed under the control and direction of God the Holy Spirit? Can we see and marvel at his work in us? Or as we look upon our hearts, and into our lives are we like those of whom Paul warns Timothy that they have a form of godliness but they deny its power those who have nothing more than an outward appearance of Christianity but know nothing of the power of Christ and his gospel, and his work in their hearts. And there's a simple test that we can apply this morning, if we're honest enough with ourselves, as to whether we know the coming of his kingdom in power, present with us. And it's found in what we sang in that last hymn, To whom he manifests his love and grants his name to know. To them the cross with all its shame, with all its grace, is given. Has he manifested his love? Has he granted you to know his name? Have you experienced his grace? poured upon you. Here is the essence of Christian life and Christian faith. It's not how we are living. It's not how we are serving. It's not how we are witnessing or how we are worshipping. But has his grace and his love been poured into us? Well, maybe this morning you're asking, how will I know? How will I know if his grace and his love has been poured into my heart? How will I know if his kingdom is present in power? Well, the answer is simple, and it's in the question. It comes with power. It comes with power that causes 
a reaction. A love like that we have described in that glorious song of Solomon. That language that so beautifully captures the power of Christ's love towards his people. And the reaction and the love that it stirs in return. He brought me to the banqueting house. And his banner over me was love. Sustain me with cakes of raisins. Refresh me with apples for I am love sick. That's the power of Christ and of his love as it's manifest and poured into the heart of a sinner. It makes them lovesick for him. Not read that book recently. Read it again. See the power of true love. Yes, see the power of true love in the context of a human relationship, but see the deeper love of Christ. If you know it, then you know the power that is present when Christ's kingdom comes. And so, as with his love, so with his grace. His grace, when it pours into the heart, comes with peace and with hope and with joy and with assurance. We started our service by reading those words of Paul. In Corinthians, he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. The words are well known to many of us. They are oft repeated. But is the truth and the experience of them known to us? Is this morning... His grace sufficient for you? Or are you one who is constantly looking for something else or someone else to sustain and uphold you? Has his strength been made perfect in your weakness? Or in your weakness have you become overwhelmed and crushed and despairing? What is your cry as you come this morning? Is it a cry for Christ and his strength? Or is it a seeking of man and his approval? You know, these words which are so well known are a real challenge. Because how many truly can say that when they are weak, they are strong? Not in themselves, but in him. But when you've known the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, when you've known the power which sustains and keeps and preserves, then you will, like Paul, be most glad of those times when you so desperately need it. Because it is those times when his presence is most keenly felt and when his power is most keenly seen. It is those times when the believer most gloriously knows the reality of his power and of his love. To the natural mind, it's counterintuitive. To the logical mind of the world, it's a paradox. But to those who see the kingdom of God present with power, 
It is the blessing and the glory of fellowship with their God and their Saviour. Here, as the Lord Jesus Christ closes these instructions to his disciples, he brings before them an encouragement. He brings before them a challenge. And he stirs in them an expectation. For all of the miracles that they have witnessed, and for all of the teaching they have received from his lips, The Lord Jesus Christ promises that something even more glorious and more wonderful will be revealed in the days ahead. Now many, if not all, of those who heard these words at the time would have thought in terms of an earthly kingdom. A kingdom of the Jews based upon political and military might. But Christ, as we've already considered, had a far greater kingdom in mind. A kingdom that would continue to grow and has continued to grow throughout the 2,000 years since he uttered these words and will continue to grow until the day when the archangel's trumpet is heard and every eye sees Christ in all his glory. And today the ex expectation of the church should be no less than it was when these words were spoken his kingdom is present now in power but it continues to conquer and it continues to be revealed in new hearts as we gather here this morning we are part of the body of Christ we should be gathering with an expectation that the kingdom of Christ continues to grow, continues to conquer, that we should have an expectation that we will see it and witness it in our midst here, in our homes and our families, and in the community of this town of Bedworth. The reading that we had Uh, We read of the uh, transfiguration of the Lord Jesus Christ. And as Peter and James and John witnessed something of the glory of Christ, Peter declares in verse 5, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. How true it is if we are privileged to see the glory of Christ revealed not in a physical experience of his person, but in the power of his gospel at work. In the power of the Spirit as he brings new life into the dead soul. The glory of Christ as a sinner's are transformed into saints. As his words accomplishes all that he has purposed. To marvel as the light of the gospel breaks into the darkness of the human heart and the power of that irresistible call that pulls those found in darkness and slavery to sin into the loving embrace of the Saviour who died for them. I'm going to close shortly by singing Great is the mystery of godliness. Great is the work of God's own holiness. It moves my soul and causes me to long for greater joys than to the earth belong. We are witnesses. Brothers and sisters in Christ. 
with the kingdom of God present with power. We see it, and we can see it on the earth, although it is not of the earth. And if you've known it for yourself, how you will long to see it and know it in others. How you will desire above all else to praise the King of love as his kingdom grows. If you're a Christian this morning, if you know the presence of his kingdom with power in your life, you should be expectant not only for what Christ is continuing to do in the world and of how he is continuing to build his kingdom, but you should be expectant for what he is doing in and through you. When Christ comes in power, he comes with a purpose, a purpose to save, a purpose to keep, but a purpose to call, to call to service, to call to submission. These individuals, they were told of the coming of the kingdom. They were told of the glory and the victory of Christ, but they had to wait to witness it. And you know, sometimes we have to wait. We have to wait upon Christ to see what it is that he is working within us. But I can assure you this morning, if you are found in his body, then there is more for you to do. Your service is not yet complete. And as you look to the future, you should be looking expectantly as to what his power and his grace will do further in your life. What his grace and his power and his strength will enable you to do in service to him. Today is not a day for being self-absorbed and self-centered. Today is a day for the Christian to be looking eagerly with expectation as to what their master has purposed for them. What their master is doing and working in them. Looking forward with expectation. to the opportunities to show forth his power, his praise, his glory. And this morning, I encourage you to wait upon him, to listen to him, to faithfully follow him, And to be expectant that he is yet to do more for you and in you and has yet more for you to serve him. And he said to them, assuredly I say to you, that there are some standing here who will not taste death till they see the kingdom of God present with power. An encouragement that assuredly upon this earth there is a kingdom that is God's and it is present with power. A challenge that assuredly there are those who will hear of this kingdom.
but we'll never know it. And an expectation that as this kingdom comes, it will transform and continue to transform. And it will come with a purpose for the lives of those who are his. Amen.